Okay, all. Uh, I am Jeff Young. I'm chairman of the Board of Supervisors here in Palmer Township. Um, I just real quick want to introduce some other board members and want to let you know that we're going to have to skedaddle at like 10 to 7 because we have a board meeting that we have to be at at 7. Uh, Joseph Armato, Mike Brett, and Emery Pinella. It's four of the five. We happen to be uh, all Democrat board, although on the local level it doesn't really matter to us as much, but it certainly matters when we get to Susan's level. Um, it is an extreme honor for me to introduce Susan. Um, she has been helpful to where I work. I work at Suburban EMS. Uh, they helped us when we had some trouble with some of the COVID grant funding. They, they cracked open the back door so we could get our funding. We were shorted 115000 Her office helped me get in so we could get it back. And can I talk about the other one, Susan? Sure. And two Fridays ago, Susan called me, and we were picked for the community investment. I was saying that right. Community investment of one of her 15 picks. Uh, that was going to move forward to the Appropriations Committee. It's to fund Suburban's uh, 2023 education budget in full. It's over $200,000 grant. Um, so I wanted to, I wanted everybody to know how much she's doing for our constituents. The Suburban serves 19 communities in Northampton, Lehigh County. I'm sorry, Northampton and Monroe County. Um, so on behalf of all Palmer, and if we come, if we ever come again on a non-meeting night, we will fill this room for you. <laughs> um, we we're so pleased to have such a great congresswoman here for us, Susan. Yeah. Washington 
and invited my colleagues across the aisle to, that I would work with them on any kind of common sense legislation they are willing to work on. I haven't yet had anybody take me up on that offer. So what I, I, you know, I don't know what your party affiliation is here in this room. I know that our district is pretty much 50-50 in terms of party registration as well as a lot of independents. So, you know, if anybody has any thoughts, share them with us, please, if you're willing to. If you're willing to state whether you're a gun owner, please do, but you don't have to state that. And I actually have somebody from my team who's here taking notes on anything that's offered up. Okay. Uh, whatever happened to the Toomey Mansion bill? I know it's been a while, but. The Toomey Mansion bill that was for, I believe, for uh, universal background checks, if I'm not mistaken, and that was a number of years ago now, and I, I believe it was defeated in the Senate. I think it came up for a vote. It was before my time in Congress. But I'm pretty sure it was defeated. And that's an interesting point because universal background checks are mostly well thought of as, as a, something we should do in this country, and yet we haven't managed to get it done. But I will, will say this, because I mean, my mind has been racing over the last hour. Universal background checks will cut out a lot of crime, but it won't, it's not gonna discover, maybe the 18 year old in Buffalo would have done something because I understand there was some sort of referral for a psychiatric evaluation that may or may not have been triggered by a background check. But I think a lot of what we're seeing is actually being committed by people that wouldn't necessarily be flagged on a background check, so. Yes, ma'am. Gun shows and um, see, I'm now too loud. <laughs> um, internet sales that aren't really controlled. I think that is an area that is really lacking in in some restrictions. That would be maybe helpful. Well, I do think I will say this. I think that the vast majority of gun dealers, people who actually sell guns in stores and otherwise are doing so legitimately, they're following the ATF requirements and that kind of thing. I've got a lot of concern about ghost guns, and I've got a lot of the ones that have no serial number or anything. Um, you know, there was, I know that there has been legislation attempted, especially at the local level, that all um, lost or stolen guns have to be reported within a certain hour. And I don't know the exact state of the gun show, uh, regulations that are in place in Pennsylvania. So that would be something that you'd be concerned about. Again, we don't know what the circumstances are of this fellow today. Yes, ma'am. Where is the divide among Republicans, Democrats, liberals, conservatives? Who doesn't think that not shooting school children is a good idea? I don't, so. I don't understand how it can't be, I mean, well, I, I, I think that what we see is a concern that people have, that law-abiding people who are gun owners are, or want to own guns for sporting purposes or self-defense, um, that there is a concern that, that's going, that it's a slippery slope. And that we're going to have, you know, we're going to lead to legislation that's going to take away people's guns or their right to have a gun. Um, I have no interest in doing that. I don't know of any of my colleagues who do, but that seems to be the pervasive message that is being communicated. Um, you know, it, it's so the answer is I don't think anybody thinks that shooting elementary school students is something that we shouldn't try to stop. But, you know, the point that I heard a little while ago while I was driving over here is that when 9-11 happened, in this country we did every single thing we could possibly come up with on a very bipartisan basis to make sure that 9-11 would, something like 9-11 would never happen again. And, in fact, it hasn't. And yet, we can't seem to do this 
with school shootings with these elementary school kids. And it's just, if I seem emotional about it, I am. I'm, I'm real, I mean, I passed Palmer Elementary on the way in and just couldn't help but think. And I will tell you, my worst nightmare as a member of Congress is that it, something like this happens in our district. It is literally, the first thing I think of after I think of the children and their families is, and I don't know who the representative is for this district in Texas, but the next thing I think of is, you know, there but for the grace of God. So, yes, ma'am. anything against guns, but how about raising the stakes a little? I mean, I have to pay insurance on my car. I have to pay insurance because I have a pool in my backyard. Why not ante up on having insurance on gun owners? And hey, if you're a great gun owner and you've had your guns for a while, you get the discount rate, right? And, and anybody who's a kid, you're paying a million dollar policy. That's one way to address it, maybe. Anybody here that disagrees with the idea of liability insurance for, okay, sir, you do? I mean, yeah. You know, I, I have a problem being forced to get auto insurance. I mean, I, I, have, I want it, I have I help from my house and things of that nature. Then you, but the, the, the concept is these type of weapons, which are very destructive, obviously. Uh, then it'd be nice, too. I mean, how far do you want to carry this thing down the road? Uh, I won't give the Second Amendment its purpose. That's another conversation unto itself, but it does apply. So um, I get it, but I disagree with it. You disagree with the idea of yes. liability insurance? I get it. And by the way, let me just say, I, it's not as though I think that liability insurance is going to compensate those parents who just lost, lost their child. That's not my, I mean, there probably would be claims made under the insurance and they would get some sort of payout, but believe me, they'd rather have their kids back. But the one thing I will tell you, you make the point. My kid has to pay extra high car insurance. Car insurance rates. Because he's just out of the Well, the pay. thought that I always have is when I bought a house and I went to apply for my homeowner's insurance and the inspector had noticed a crack in my sidewalk with which the insurance company insisted that I have fixed before they would issue my policy. And it's, you know, so, I mean, insurance companies have a way of getting things done, whether we like them or we don't like them, because, you know, whether it's safe gun storage, kids in your home, you know, how these guns are being secured and that kind of thing. So, yes, ma'am, in the yellow jacket there. Hi there. Uh, we, we have to pay extra insurance because we have dogs. And, and uh, you know, the fact that um, anything we do, the insurance company wants to know about, and it is a protective, it doesn't just, it's, yeah, we pay, the, we pay the price. We don't like to pay high premiums either. But the fact is this, it's a way of making people take care of themselves. And that's what we're not doing here. I am not a gun owner. My father was murdered when I was 16 years old, and I would hate to tell you what these families are going to go through because I was left an orphan and I had to make it on my own from 16 to now. And it was with the grace of, of kind people who got me through. And I believe in education, education. And I think some of our Congress people need to be re-educated as to what we're trying to do. You're saying, you know, that the gun owners the last presidential election uh, and the one before that, I asked people uh, why they were voting in certain ways. And it was, I lived in Monroe County. And it came down to guns. Everything was about guns. It wasn't about you know, taking care of our, our planet, taking care of our children, taking care of our education. It was taking care of their guns. What we, I think, what we may want to aim for is finding out exactly, you know, when people say, I don't want this, that doesn't solve anything. What we need to know is what do you want us to do to resolve the problem? You have, you can't, you can't say no to everything without giving some kind of resolution that would help us fix it. And I think that's exactly what's wrong right now with our politicians is that no one wants to say yes to anything, no one wants to bend. And I think as, as a nation, we have got to come together because losing our children is losing our future. Well, thank you for that. And I just wanna say, 
about your comments that I agree with you. It, it's, um, I think what I see and hear more than anything else is this desire that people have to be able to come together as a community, to care about our neighbors, to not worry if the guy who pulls over and helps you when you uh, have a flat tire on the side of the road is, is, has ill intent. Um, it, you know, I think there is a real desire to get back to, um, you know, community over chaos, um, votes over violence, and, um, and, you know, heart over hate. Um, it sounds awfully, awfully simplistic, but I really do believe that that's what the vast majority of Americans want. So, um, thank you. Yes, sir, you had a comment here in the blue shirt. Hi, uh, just wanted to say uh, thank you, first of all, for having the uh, town hall this evening and for facilitating this conversation. I, I think it is uh, very good that we would have that. Um, as a pastor, I look to the issue of the value of life. I think the value of life has been greatly diminished in our culture today. Uh, so as I would see it, uh, that certainly the federal government wouldn't have a place in the current discussion uh, about these shootings. If anything, it would be at the state level. Uh, but I think most importantly, we need a restoration of the value of life. And that's greatly lacking today. Thank you. OK, well, let's do two more. We, uh, yes, sir. Here, Mr. Yeah, my, uh, <clears throat> my question is, uh, what's that? Yeah, <laughs> just if there is any common ground to work off of in Congress, I feel like we hear uh, you know, so much of the, uh, the, the you know, opposing sides, especially with the gun issue, but I'm wondering if there's any common ground we can go off of, and I don't know if that's like increased school security or, or things like that, but, but what can be done and what is being done to work together? So that's where, what, that's where I'm so frustrated because I'm not finding common ground. When I stood on the, t on the House floor and literally addressed myself to the other side of the room and said, I will work with any one of you who has some sort of common sense solution for what we're facing, and I don't frankly remember which, oh, I know what prompted that. Uh, I would, it was after the, the young man, the father of three, was shot at the Wawa over on Route 100 on his way to work at five o'clock in the morning by a crazed gunman. Um, and I, I gave a floor speech about that, and it was at the conclusion of that that I turned to the other side of the room. I haven't heard back from any of my colleagues, and the answer is no, I don't know of any common ground on this issue, sad to say. That's why I'm opening it up to discussion in a room full of people that I don't know what your party affiliation is because I really want some ideas that I might be able to take back. So I'm sorry, that's, I, that's pessimistic, but that's where we are, unfortunately. You would think, you know, it's been said that after 20 elementary school students died in in uh, Newtown, Connecticut, that if we didn't do something then, are we ever going to? And this is just 15 more begs the question. Yes, sir. It seems to me that um, two people who spoke before me, uh, the pastor and this young lady over here, um, we're talking about something, the, the, the value of life. I think we have a problem here in our nation today. We don't value life. We've lost the value of life. Um, how we get that back, well, that's that's a big problem. That's a big problem, and that's going to take years to get it, to get that back. Um, but one thing that, that as I've seen is that there is a glorification in our society today for violence. We see it all around us, and it, we're bombarded with it. Violence is glorified, and we see it in the media. I wonder sometimes if, on a congressional level, on a national level, some task force might be put together, a task force, a panel, or something, to communicate with the media that bombards us with these images of violence. And especially our young people, you know, it's somehow or other, and I'm not talking about the Hollywood actors because they've come out and spoken against guns and things like that. And sometimes they're not on the money with their opinions. And they think that, that because they're a Hollywood actor, you know, they're, 
you know, their opinion matters more than anybody else. But I'm talking about the people who put the money up for things like this, for these images that we see every day that are on the television, that are on the movies, that are on the computers. I'm talking about the producers and the directors. Why can't we, why can't Congress or politicians get together with them and say, look, we have a problem in our country. You know? These same things are in every single country, and they do not have the same problems we have. So I totally disagree with you. Maybe there is a lack of value of life in this country, but it's not because of the media. It is because of our culture, because it doesn't happen in any other nation. But isn't our culture... Well let me just say, I, I'm going to agree that it's not just the media, because the media to a certain extent has a responsibility to cover crimes and that kind of thing. I am going to bring this to a close, but I am just going to say, because I want to get onto questions and answers that people have, um, I, I do believe it comes from the top. I think that every elected official and every leader in every community has an obligation not to be stoking division which is what is happening right now. It's happening, and, and that the media does cover because it makes ratings, you know, and all of that. But, but quite honestly, if, if you are a nice person and you don't attack, you know, the other side of the aisle or, and you don't go after your opponent in an election, you're deemed not even to be newsworthy because it's not interesting enough for the, the public apparently eats up this kind of divisive language, but I do believe it starts at the top. I think every leader in every community, and that includes every elected official, has an absolute obligation to take some sort of oath that they're not going to try to make this country or this community worse by stoking division. Because what I said at the beginning, I, I believe, I believe we want to get back to the days of bake sales and neighborhood car washes and and kids being free to, to walk around their neighborhood. Um, and I, I, th I sense that there's a really strong desire for that, and we're, I just we're missing the piece. Well, last comment here. One thing I have to say about politicians is that they, they, they want to be elected, they, go, they try to get their votes, they get in office, and they forget who put them there. They, they, don't, they do not listen to their constituents. They do not. They don't follow them, they do it. They say they're doing it, and yet they turn around and do something different. And where does that leave the general public w saying, what is going on, and why did we vote for that person? And that's one of the reasons people don't come out to vote. I understand that. And I hope that I, I, hope that you, I will dispel any feelings about me as a politician. That I, uh, but no, I know you weren't being personal with it, but, but you're right about that. I just want to acknowledge, speaking of elected officials, that County Executive Lamont McClure is here. Thank you, County Executive McClure. Um, thank you for the work you've done for Northampton County. And I know you're not able to stay for the whole meeting, but I really appreciate you being here. I am going to just completely pivot at this point and get back to um, this, the, the questions and answers that people might have. Um, you know, you're, you were all good enough to come out on an evening and you know, have your questions ready, and I want to be here to answer them. I do want to just address two things that are in the news, other than the shooting, that I think will be the subject of questions, so I, I'm going to try to address those head on. Um, the first, of course, is rising costs. Gas prices, the price of food, how people on a fixed income are going to get by when the costs of living are going up. And let me just say, I am personally acutely aware of that. I drive back and forth to Washington almost every week. I fill up my own car and I, I watch those prices go up. When I come back from DC and I, the first thing I do is I head to the grocery store because I've got an empty fridge at home and I, I've honestly been astonished by what I'm seeing. So I care about this and I care about this because I talk to all of you and when I say all of you, I mean people in this community. People are living on fixed incomes, they're living on incomes where it's the vast majority of their take home pay, if they're working, is going towards putting a roof over their head. Because we all know what's happened to the cost of housing. 
everywhere, but it's particularly in this case here in our community. And it's something that I consider to be my number one priority right now, is to work to get those costs down. Now, I will tell you that it, there's no, it's not like you can turn a switch and the prices come down. Um, it's a multifaceted approach. I think some things are happening that, we're, that are going to yield results. A lot of that has to do with supply chain. Nobody ever even knew, even talked about supply chain until six months ago, and all of a sudden everybody knows supply chain and what it means. Um, we've got shipping costs that are out of control. Of course, we're now also going to see trucking costs continuing to go up because, with the price of diesel going up. And but when it, I've for more than a year now been working on the the supply chain issue with the shipping companies in particular bringing in imports from other countries that are price gouging um, as a result of, of the pandemic. When they basically took contracts, we have employers and manufacturers right here in this district who have told me that they had a contract with a shipping company that to ship their freight at a certain price and they essentially said, too bad, we're not gonna honor the contract. You know, it's supply and demand. Um, the demand is for shipping of goods, and the supply is there, aren't, there isn't enough of it. So um, I've been working very hard on that. Um, I don't have magic solutions, but I will tell you that it is at the absolute top of my list of the things that I'm working on, and some of the specifics I will, I will talk about probably in answer to questions. Um, the other issue that I wanted, and, and by the way, I do believe that price gouging is a serious problem. Last, last week, I voted in favor of the um, Consumer Fuel Price Gouging Prevention Act. What we know, and this is, this is a verifiable fact, oil companies' profits are increasing, and I don't just mean the gross amount, I mean the percentage of their profit is increasing at a time when every single person in this room is paying too much for a gallon of gas. And we cannot let that happen, both at the federal level and every state attorney general in, in the country needs to be cracking down on price gouging. And by the way, it's not just oil and gas, it's other goods as well. Um, so I just want you to know that I'm extremely worried about that. Um, we'll talk about prescription drugs at some point. I'm, I've been working, my mission, literally, if you haven't heard my name in co the context of trying to reduce prescription drugs, then I'm, I'm obviously not getting the word out. This, this is my, I have been fixated on this issue and getting the price of prescription drugs down ever since I got to Congress, getting to the point where we can, where Medicare can negotiate with Big Pharma, which will have the effect not only of benefiting Medicare recipients, but every consumer of prescription drugs. And by the way, that also benefits taxpayers, because guess who pays for Medicare? All of us. So that's got to happen, and I'm dismayed that on both sides of the aisle, and I will call out my own party on this too, that elected officials are way too influenced by pharmaceutical lobbyists. I do not take any money from pharma, and I made that pledge. I actually don't take any corporate PAC money, but particularly, I will never take money from pharma, including somebody in the executive suite working in a pharma company who's just an individual, not his corporate pack, I won't take their money because I don't want to be even remotely conflicted on this issue that needs to bring, that, that is so critical to people in this district. Um, so let me just, uh, the other significant issue that everybody's heard about, it may not affect many people in this room, but baby formula. Um, obviously, here we are. You know, at a, a point where something that it's not like you're, they're sold out of Captain Crunch at the grocery store. They're literally sold out of something that your baby needs to get by. Uh, so, I, on this is a very good point, is because... Let, let me just, hang on one second. Let me just finish my thought process and then I'll, I'll open it up to a question there. So, um, I will say that I have some degree of separation with the administration in turn, not so much President Biden, but the agencies that are in charge of watching these things. We, this, so the, the original cause of the baby formula shortage is that Abbott was shut down because of some children who were 
injured by use of their product. Fair enough. But it took from September of last year till February of this year before there was even a recall of their product and this shutdown occurred. So between September and February, what I want to know is what agency was overseeing this, recognizing that there was a problem, recognizing that we're going to have a shortage if Abbott has to shut down because Abbott pr provides something like, I sh I'm so bad with this. 40%. What is it? 40%. Okay, I thought it was higher than that, but Abbott provides, he, the gentleman says 40% of all baby formula consumed in this country. Now, by the way, states for, for um, w the WIC program, the Women, Infants, and Children program, um, many states will contract with a specific formula maker, and you think, well, why do we want a state like, let's say, Pennsylvania just going to one formula maker? Well, the reason is because they get price breaks. You know, they buy a lot of it, so they get a price break. That makes sense. But if they happen to buy it from Abbott, well, then th guess what? They are just completely out of luck. So um, we did have a bill last week, um, which is, and I, I'm going to mention it because it actually has already borne um, some some uh, results. We um, the, the Affordable Baby Formula Now Act was passed last week, and what it does is it gives people flexibility, especially people who are using WIC benefits, that they don't have to buy the Abbott, if, which is currently mandated. So, and it, it also gives the federal government flexibility in getting formula from other countries with approved manufacturing processes. So, the, what, the announcement I want to make is that tomorrow, May 25th, uh, the second shipment of infant formula is arriving at Dulles Airport in Virginia, and it is then being brought to Nestle here in the Lehigh Valley for distribution, a very large quantity of it. So that program, I am in agreement. You know, the op I think it's called Operation Fly Formula, where we're literally sending military planes around the country, I mean around the world, to get formula to bring back to the United States. It's a shame that we got to this point, but I'm okay with, I, I don't like the fact that we got to this point. I think that there should have been more oversight at the beginning. I think the response is the right one, and hopefully we are well on our way to solving this problem. But it's just, it's, to me, it's, it's outrageous that we would have gotten to this point. So that's all I'm gonna say on baby formula right now. What I wanna do, I have a lot of other things I wanted to comment on, but, um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about some of the things we've done, but but I think what I want to do in the interest of time is start getting some questions from folks, which is what we're here for. And Jessica has a microphone, Jed has a microphone. If anybody has a question, go ahead. So what happened with Abbott is you had one plant and they had one FDA sighting. That's called not having enough spread of your product. And it's a big problem, I think, not just with baby formula, which was acutely felt by women and children, but you have cable companies. I think there's been way too much growth into banks, monopolies. What about breaking up some of these companies and saying, spreading out things so that we don't have a, a dependency on one large company? I don't disagree with you, but I, I also think we have to be very careful that we don't equate the baby formula shortage with the price of cable. Just because there are certain, I'm just saying, well, there, there are, there, when you're talking about something that is absolutely essential for human life, there, it requires. Why is it allowed, why are, it is allowed, if it's so essential for human life, why is it allowed to have just one plant knock down our supply chain? And well, and that's exactly the lesson that has to be learned from this emergency. We, and if we don't learn lessons from every negative experience we have in this country, then shame on us. So we've got a situation, an unprecedented situation as far as I can tell. I, I explained that the reason we have single source, and it's not the only, there are other providers of infant formula, but it's not spread out enough. But the reason you'll have a state, whatever state you, you might want to talk about that has a single provider for the WIC formula, by the way, if you're not dependent on WIC, you can go buy whatever formula you want that's on your store shelves. 
But the reason is because that they do that with WIC is to bring down the cost. And it, it's a huge cost saving. I will tell you that because I had the same question you did originally. And by the way, it was more than just one complaint about Abbott. I mean, there were two deaths and there were multiple reports of children getting sick. It was blatant and it was really poor. Okay. So, yes, sir. We got a question up here in the yeah. front row. In, in regards to the Abbott. So, so when Abbott became compromised, I, I find it apprehensible that nobody on the board of Abbott thought that they supply 40% of the formula to the country and nobody thought to throw up a flag that this was going to create a massive issue in the country. Where, where were the safeguards? Where was the oversight? And is anybody holding them accountable? Excuse me, and that's, that's exactly what I'm saying. The oversight issue, first of all, there's the issue of corporate responsibility. Somebody, you're right, somebody on the board should have said, hey, FDA, hey, Department of Agriculture, we're gonna have a problem here. I think they were trying to avoid a shutdown, but as the complaints continue to come in of children, I mean, and that's kind of typical corporate behavior. You don't really want to admit that you've got a problem. But that's where the oversight, and listen, I am not all about the government overreaching. Um, I, I will absolutely tell you that I think it's important that the government gives industry enough leash that they can do the right thing in their industry and use good tactics. But when something like this happens, it makes you think we perhaps we need more oversight in some uh, industries for sure. Scale, yes. Yeah. So. I, yeah, I just feel like that we've gone too far into giving companies too much leeway to do whatever they want and to grow to whatever level they want. And now we end it all. Well, as I said, we better learn a lesson from this. Yes, ma'am, in the back. Yeah, I, I was. I saw that there's been some changes in the in the D triple C, and I was wondering if you have confidence in Sean Patrick Maloney as the new chair. Okay, well, let's get to a, a question that is uh, not one I expected to get at town hall, but I will tell you that it is something that is discussed pretty much every single day among members of Congress um, in the Democratic Caucus. Um, and I don't know how many people in the room, or I, I frankly wasn't thinking that it would be national news that people would be aware of, but the controversy goes something like this. The Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, which is the organization whose job it is to get incumbents like me and others reelected and to help new candidates, and by the way, the Republicans have a similar conference, um, is headed up by a representative by the name of Sean Patrick Maloney, and recently what happened with redistricting in New York, which is where he is, is that the, the maps were sort of thrown all asunder, and every, every representative was scrambling for which district they were, going, they were going to run in, and Mr. Maloney opted to run in a district where he actually lives, although you're not required to live in your district to serve it in Congress, but that is not his current district because of the way they reconfigured the maps. And specifically, it meant that he would, and he announced this within a matter of half an hour, I think, and he would be taking on a freshman incumbent by the name of Mondaire Jones, who currently represents that district. So that just gives you, a, for those of you who didn't already know the saga, um, so the, the question that has come up for a lot of us, for, and if I didn't mention Mr. Maloney as the chair of the DCCC. So the question that came up for a lot of people is, how can he run the DCCC if he's immediately injecting himself in a race against an incumbent whose job it kind of is his to protect that incumbent? So the answer to the question is, um, I have feelings about it. <laughs> I, I think... Um, I, I wasn't happy with his reaction, particularly his knee-jerk reaction as I saw it within, and I was pretty vocal about it. Um, the, the man that he was, or was going to be running against, Mondaire Jones, is a good friend of mine. Um, I think he's been doing an admirable job, admirable job in his first term in Congress. As it turns out, Mr. Jones has decided to switch districts so that he won't be running against Sean Patrick. And, but it's it's not a pretty sight. But it but let me just say a lot of that has to do with with drawing maps and honestly 
I mean, we could talk about gerrymandering all night. This wasn't so much, it, there, it actually was a gerrymandering situation. I will tell you that the Democratic Party in New York overstepped themselves because they figured they could literally gerrymander New York to pick up additional Democratic seats. Yes, I'm saying that as a Democrat. And they really kind of gerrymandered it to the extreme. Now, they're certainly not the only ones who have done it. We've seen it in other states as well, Republican states. And it, it, gerrymandering is a major problem. But another problem is having these special masters come in to draw maps who don't know anything about the state. That happened here in Pennsylvania. Um, you know, one of my biggest concerns, and Jed, who's here, is my chief of staff, and he'll confirm that one of my biggest concerns was that they were going to go back to breaking up the Lehigh Valley into two, two districts, which, in my view, would be unconscionable. Um, thankfully, that didn't happen, but that's kind of the problem. So, I don't know, I probably said too much, but... <laughs> Just enough. Jed would like me to stop talking about that right now. Okay, who's got a yes, ma'am, over here in the yellow? Thank you, super. One second. Thank you, supervisors. We'll do it again sometime, when, and we'll try to schedule it on a night when you don't have an important meeting. Thank, Thank you for you so being much. here. Appreciate it. I'm concerned about the backlog of the IRS. Mm. Uh, I have, you know, nine years of our, our 2020 taxes have not been processed. And I sat two hours multiple times, never got through. I finally got through two weeks ago. They're trying to tell me that they don't know where our taxes are. However, we owed money in 2020. They cashed our check two days after we sent it. It's, it's amazing how official they are with that. Yes, right? and they tried to tell us we failed to file our taxes. I said, no, you couldn't have gotten that check because it was attached. I attached it to the return. Now, after a year, um, I tried, when we tried to file our 2021 taxes, we couldn't, we had a refund coming and we could not file electronically because we had no adjusted gross income in there. And that's when I sat on the phone two weeks ago and finally got, well, we're not going to process your 2020 until 20, I mean 2021 until your 2020 is cleared up. And the man said to me, and you're in delinquency. I said, no, I am not. I said, you have my money sitting in that account. I do not owe you taxes. I do not owe you penalties or interest. And you failed to, to, to process our 2020, and now what's happening with our 2021? So I, I think, if I'm not mistaken, maybe there's somebody with an amazingly similar fact pattern, but I believe our, my office is actually working with you yeah. on that. It is, I will tell you, we've got some of my district staff here who will tell you that it's the number one issue we're having right now. I think last year was passports, and this year it's IRS issues. I'm looking yes. at Sabrina now, yes, she's I mean, I don't know where we're going not going to go. This. I mean, how long is it going to take them? I mean, the pandemic, yes, it's a problem, and we still have problems, but I don't know where we're going with this. I mean, I honestly feel like people are using it as an excuse. So just so you know, I did introduce a bill. Hasn't, it has not yet been brought to the floor, but it's called the Taxpayer Relief Act, and it specifically has to do with IRS delays, improving the staffing at the IRS, and requiring mandatory response times. But as I said, has not yet made it to the House floor. But I, and I'm informed to go introduce that kind of legislation when I hear from my district team. Because every time I do get through, I'm told, wait another 16 weeks. And that's been, in January, And you said you weren't able to file electronically for some reason? Because, because they did not process our I see. Oh, so you couldn't show. Right. Got it. Yeah, I will say for anybody who doesn't know, if you're at all able to file electronically, it would get much better results. But I, I hear you. I, I, I share your frustration. And so does my team. Yeah, I mean, I just, I just feel like I know we're not the only one sitting there. You are not. I promise you, you are not. why I introduced the bill. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. I, mean, I hope I we get somewhere with it. I know. And there are people dependent on that tax refund also. Oh, I know. Yes, ma'am. Eventually, yeah. First it has to get passed in the house. Yes. Okay. Wait one second. I just want...
let me just finish your question. So the question, the follow-up question was, does it have to go to the Senate? Well, and that, that's another huge problem that we have. Yeah, believe me, it frustrates me. Yes, sir. Congresswoman, I'm here tonight not just because you've been uh, terrifically effective for Northampton County specifically, but because I don't get to do any foreign policy at the county level, but you do uh, at the national level in the U.S. House of Representatives. And obviously, we're all concerned about Putin's illegal invasion of Ukraine, and you've talked a lot about that recently in the media. I've been following that. But I think our greatest geopolitical challenge is China. And I think there's not enough conversation about the challenges that China poses to us uh, in the future. They're, they're our number one economic rival. And although we've seen Putin's conventional military not to be performing as well as advertised, we don't know how the Chinese conventional military would perform in any kind of hot conflict. So uh, what I'd be interested in hearing a little bit from you tonight is how serious is the uh, geopolitical threat of China to the United States? Well, the threat is there. It's mostly the, the threat, the geopolitical threat from China primarily has to do with Taiwan. Um, it is not, you know, I don't, but there, there's another geopolitical threat and that is that to the extent that China and Russia become bonded, which they somewhat already are, it's a threat to all of Europe, Eastern Europe, but it goes beyond that. And we want to avoid that situation. My guess is that China's military would be significantly more effective than Russia's, but that's just my guess, and I am not a military expert, so please don't quote me on that. Um, but I do think it's a significant concern, by the way, as long as you bring up China, I'm going to address um, the fact that the president made comments yesterday, I guess, about we would intervene if China invaded Taiwan. I. I think I have to tell you that this is a situation where I'm hoping the president misspoke. Um, the last thing in the world we want is a war with China. Um, and we certainly don't want boots on the ground in Taiwan any more than we want boots on the ground in Ukraine. Um, so, and I don't even know how we could possibly justify boots on the ground in Taiwan when it's been our stated position. The one thing I will tell you is I think that the unity that we are seeing from the NATO countries around the Ukraine war is commendable. Um, I will give the president a lot of credit for that because that hasn't been seen in a long time. I think it's essential and I'm hopeful that that is operating as a deterrent to China. I also think, remember, China also has very strong economic ties with us, whether we like it or not. Um, so. I'm a little less concerned about that for, for those reasons. Thank you. Yes, sir. May I make a comment about uh, the discussion of, I've, I've been in, uh, in Poland and Ukraine for the last two months. And I'm actually coming back on, on uh, Thursday. Came back last Saturday, or last Sunday, and I'm heading back on Thursday. So. I've actually had a very strong, direct understanding of what's going on. Uh, I agree with you completely, by the way, that the re-establishment the re of our Western alliances in NATO is, is almost miraculous when you think of the fact that 18 months ago, NATO was on its heels, was failing, was fighting with each other because of our former administration and what they, what they did. Um, Biden did an amazing job of pulling together uh, this group, and it, it's a phenomenal uh, accomplishment that is, is mind-boggling to me. I do want to say one thing. When I started to go to Poland, I asked people randomly, and I've met hundreds of people both in Ukraine and Poland, what they think of the United States. I didn't ask what they thought of the president, I asked what they thought of the United States. One after another, the comment was, thank God Joe Biden is president. Period, that's what I've heard. And I've heard that consistently from every single person I have spoken with. Um, and as I said, it's been hundreds of people. Uh, we could talk for hours about China, Taiwan, you talk about the Abbott shortage, let's talk about 
microchips, but, but I can just tell you that from my experience of what's going on in Eastern Europe, um, it, our country is looked upon very favorably at this point. Well, it's good to hear from somebody who's been on the ground. I will say, um, the one thing that I've been, there's not much to be envious of about, this, about Ukrainians right now, but the one thing I've really been impressed by is their show of solidarity. I mean, things, we think things are tough in this country. Ukraine, Ukrainians could teach us something about tough and the, the way they've come together um, is just mind boggling to me. You know, I, I'm sure many of them had differences with their president before the war broke out, but we have not seen any kind of what we see here. And to, to me, we all kind of need to learn a lesson from, from that, that we really need to pull together in, in difficult times that are not nearly as difficult as what the Ukrainians are going through. Did you have your hand up, sir? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you for addressing the Taiwan issue. I was quite concerned with those comments as well. Uh, I'm assuming that you would support military aid as in to the Ukraine situation, uh, but you're saying you don't support boots on the ground, which is as good. Uh, well, I, it would be, I think it would be a misstatement of U.S. policy to suggest that we are going to send troops into Taiwan. Um, you know, we've got a delicate relationship with China that has been carved out over a number of years, and so I don't think we should renege on that. I, as I said, I hope the president made one of his innumerable um, misstatements, um, and you know, I. I'd rather think that than think that he, he but I, I, I got the feeling that he retracted that later, so. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so. Yeah, I think of something to the effect that nothing had changed in the policy. Yeah, uh, so but, I think it would be very ill-advised. Yeah, and secondly, I have a question regarding the drilling of federal lands. I think he had recently made an announcement about that. Mm -hmm. I was wondering your position on that as well. Okay, so that gets us right squarely into the oil and domestic energy supply issue, which I think is a really important one. Um, I do believe that um, we need to solve the, the current energy crisis as quickly as we can. And while I am always going to be in favor of finding alternative sources of energy so that we are not dependent on either other countries or fossil fuels or methods that will endanger you know, water supplies and that kind of thing. I do think it's necessary that we produce as much domestic oil as possible right now. Pardon me? Very good. The one thing I will say and that bothers me is that only uh, there's so, I don't remember the exact number, there are a whole bunch of oil leases that have been granted to oil companies or drilling leases that have been granted that are not being used. It's not that simple. It's not that simple. Wait, there's a bunch of, go ahead, you, you speak. Yeah. In, in a nutshell, the regulations to go on that and actually drill that, that out would be so expensive and so outrageous it wouldn't be probably practical. These oil companies are not gonna take a chance with the, the regulational process, the regulation process that are going on. So it's actually, a, this is no we can say. Then that. I don't understand why they applied for the leases to begin with. They, they go back quite a long time, some of this stuff, the history on these things. Um, yeah. They should yeah. give up the leases then, so that if somebody else wants no, them... That, that would be great. I, I, uh, I mean, I quite honestly, I, I mean, I really do, in my heart, believe that we have to move to renewable energy, because otherwise we're just going to keep finding ourselves in this same vicious cycle where every few years gas prices go up and either oil companies or Saudi Arabia or Russia or whatever can 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 what cause about, all of us. What about nuclear? I have no. I, I actually think that's part of a renewable energy um, policy. I think it's important. Uh, the question was whether I believe that we should invest in nuclear energy, and the answer is I do. Yes. Um, it, it's. I, I'm co-chair of the climate task force of the New Democrat Coalition, which and what my other my co-chair um, is in fact a climate scientist. Um, he very much believes in nuclear energy. It can be done safely. Um, and, you know, it's, we're not talking about the kind of nuclear that we currently see in blighting our landscape and worries about meltdowns and that kind of thing. So I will tell you, I think nuclear is part of that process, yes. 
One more thing. Are you familiar with uh, Stephen Conan? Steve, Stephen Conan. I don't think so. He was in the Obama administration, a science, very high ranking. I wrote a book uh, about a year ago. Um, I can't remember the title, unfortunately. Um, it deals with this issue of climate change, quite frankly, anthropogenic climate change. Um, maybe you guys should talk to him. Bring him in. He's a, he'll explain in graphic details. He's, you know, he's a full believer in the process of, of man-made climate change. But he, his concern is that the cure is worse than the poison, which you're articulating also, I think. Um, and they, you, know, you should drill some more, and of course, the alternative of, of atomic, uh, trying to bring that process. Because when, when the solar is just not going to fulfill the obligation. But Stephen Cohen, he's a Democrat. Uh, Talk to him. Okay, take a look. Thank you. I'm sure he'd be happy to come in and talk to some of us members. Yes, sir, back there. So I have a question about the, I guess it was now previously the Build Back Better bill that kind of mm -hmm. frankly died in the Senate. Is there any update on what's going on? Because you mainly just hear from Senator Joe Manchin about it and that's basically it and he's saying that it's dead. Well, he's saying that the Build Back Better Act, as it existed, is dead. I will tell you, um, and I've said this publicly before, I think we, we overshot that one. There was way too much in there, um, and I don't know when we're going to learn the lesson in Congress that when you put too much in a bill, it's, gonna, it's doomed to fail. Um, but I don't get to make those decisions, unfortunately. I wish I did. Um, there is, there are attempts, and I think they're pretty solid attempts being made to introduce, I'm not even going to call it the Build Back Better Act, but to introduce a new package which includes um, a billionaire's tax, which would go a long way towards paying for it. That brings up IRS issues, by the way, and that's another whole, you know, we got to, if we're going to start demanding that the 1% of the 1% pay their fair share, we got to figure out how we're going to enforce that and how, but... Anyway, um, it is also, I believe, going to include a provision, my personal favor, um, for negotiation of drug prices. Obviously, we've passed this bill that you've all heard so much about to cap the price of insulin at $35 a month. Well, that's great if you need insulin, but it doesn't do much for you if you need expensive asthma inhalers or cancer drugs or heart medications or whatever. And we really, I, it's just, staggering to me that we are subsidizing the price of cheaper pharmaceuticals for every other country in the world. I mean, one of the things, by the way, one of the things that I can get on board with a Republican proposal, I, I rarely utter these words, Ron DeSantis had a proposal that I actually agree with, which is that you should be able to import your drugs from whatever country you choose to. Um, I, I'm okay with that because you know what? That would put a whole lot of pressure on our pharmaceutical companies. If all of a sudden you could buy your, you know, whatever medication, not only from Canada, which a lot of people were, were doing and still are doing, but France, Britain, wherever. So that, I believe something will be included that will be of significance. Um, there will also be, from what I understand, some provisions having to do with childcare and the overwhelming cost of childcare. I mean, we're, we have no shortage of crises, let's face it. You know, we've got people who are finishing their higher education, they've got student loan debt that, that you know, is staggering. The thought of getting married and having a kid and then paying that child care that's as much as my monthly mortgage for them is, you know, out of sight. So there, there are some provisions in there for that. So what we are trying to do is come up with a bill that we know can make it through the Senate. Um, and by the way, that wouldn't be a 60 vote bill. It would be another reconciliation package that requires 50, but Build Back Better would have required 50, and as we know, it got stalled for reasons that I think are partly our own fault. You guys are great. Good questions. I'm really sorry that, you know, it kind of, I we got a little bit derailed because of um, my discussion at the beginning, but I think it was important and I appreciate hearing. Um, any other questions before you again? Did you, yeah. yeah, I just wanted to see if anybody else had one before we came back to you. Go ahead. Uh, what if you had any uh, input on the shortage of dye for uh, MRIs? My girlfriend needs to get one currently, and I guess there's a, a serious shortage on that. They uh -huh. do to possibly the lock.
My, my chief seems to know about so, it. So, yeah, I clear that. Go ahead. We talked about, actually, I don't know if you were on the call, but St. Luke's and the chain problem, um, where this, when the supply chains work and the one supplier is great, when it's not, it's not so great. <laughs> so, but yeah, we, we've been seized to the issue. The local health networks brought it to our attention and they're, they're trying, they're, they're, they've been able to find alternatives locally um, and regionally. But it's something that's going to continue to be a problem if, if the administration doesn't engage with it. So we're starting to try to get them to help do that. So just to follow up on that, every Friday, well, starting with the beginning of, with the day the world shut down because of COVID, we convened, we convened a call with, literally, is we take the, the information we get in those calls and then we start trying to solve the problems, which I think we've had a pretty good rate of success at. So this just came up on the last Friday call, right? I was not able to be a part of that call, so, um, but I guess we're working on that. But this is, so this is just part of a bigger problem, which is how dependent are we on the rest of the world, particularly China, for things that are essentials, you know, in this country. I mean, at the beginning of, COVID, we had governors taking jets to China to, to pick up masks for, you know, health care. We literally did. Our governor did that. Um, I am a big, big believer that we've got to return manufacturing to this country. Yeah. 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 And I say that as a representative of a district that was literally founded on manufacturing. I mean, it was a different kind of manufacturing that we're talking about, but steel and trucks and and you know, while well, we're still doing the trucks, thank, thank you, Mac Trucks, for coming back to the Lehigh Valley. But um, this regional hub innovation act, where so you know how you hear about the Silicon Valley, and everybody kind of knows that's tech, and a lot of people know that the North Carolina Triangle is a big manufacturing se sector. But what we need is for that to be spread out throughout the country, and the Lehigh Valley needs to be one of those hubs. We already have the infrastructure, and I don't mean roads and bridges, we have the infrastructure needed. We've got colleges and universities that graduate all of these people in engineering and sciences. Uh, we've got community colleges that do a fabulous job of helping with workforce training programs. We've got manufacturers already here producing computer chips and semiconductors and advanced medical equipment and COVID at home tests and everything you can imagine. This needs, and, and it's not just this district, but of course I'm a little biased. This is, I think we have to be one of those hubs. Um, but we've got to bring this manufacturing back to this country. It's really led to so, I mean, when we're talking about higher prices, when we're talking about shortages of MRI dye, it, it can be, when we're talking about shipping costs being out of control, it's, all, it can all be traced back to the fact that we essentially have outsourced manufacturing in this country for decades now. And, and a lot of that has to do with the reputation of manufacturing, which I'm happy to say I think we're finally turning the tide on that. But for years, it wasn't considered an elite occupation to be involved in manufacturing. Everybody thought their kid needed to go to college and get a four-year liberal arts degree and the number of kids out there with a huge amount of student loan debt and a liberal arts degree. Technical schools are the way to go, but I'm not suggesting, there is a place for those, those four-year colleges that produce liberal arts majors. It's just that we can't do it to the exclusion of other careers, and we've got to change our thinking. We've got to have parents talking to their kids about getting a job in manufacturing, We've got, it's got, I mean, Germany sees manufacturing as an elite, uh, elite area to work in. And we've got to get to, we've that's got to have that mentality. Pardon? Met. That's because they pay and they have unions. Well, that's all part of it. I mean, that's all part. And by the way, the manufacturers here, their pay is not too shabby either. If they could find the workers that they need, we'd have a lot of people making really, really good money. It's a very proud thing made in the USA. 100%. So. Um, okay, I'm getting the time thing, but I want to, I, I don't want to, yes, please, I'm not excluding anybody. If people feel the need to leave because we're going past the time, feel free to. It's not a critical question, but... Uh, Every question is a question, <laughs> critical question. Anybody still believe that at some point Medicare will offer some uh, coverage for hearing aids? Mm -hmm. I'm on my third pair, I'm 75. They last about five years. I'm lucky. 
I can afford the $6,000 that cost me to buy these hearing aids. Without them, I wouldn't be able to hear you right now. Right. Even with the microphone. So, at, at, right. As the daughter of a man who needed hearing aids for 20 years uh, before he passed away, believe me, I, I, I feel what you're talking about. So the question was about expanding Medicare to include hearing aids. There have been a number of proposals made to expand Medicaid to include eyesight, hearing, and teeth. And it gets, and by the way, that was part of the Build Back Better Act, I think, but I think that got cut before we ever sent the Build Back Better Act over. Um, I was very much in support of that. Um, I don't know how you treat eyes and teeth and ears as something other than part of the human body. Um, and frankly, with seniors, those are some of the most important things. If, if you can't hear somebody and you're in a family gathering, Everybody's had that uncle who sits in the corner and can't really hear what's going on and nobody tries to talk to him because it's so hard to communicate with him and it's really bad for him. It's really bad for the family. But you know, we know that the connection between dental health and heart disease is absolutely confirmed. And eyesight, I mean, we all know how important our eyesight is. So I absolutely think it's gotta be included in Medicare. It, I've been working with a group of people who have really been trying to push that. We haven't made a whole lot of progress. I hate to say it. Um, I, I hope to see that. But Where's AARP? Well, the AARP is very much in favor of it, but they, um, and they, they do lobby a lot. They've got, you know, they've got a lot of people that, that listen to them. Uh, any, uh, yes, ma'am. Since uh, Roe v. Wade might be overturned soon, I was wondering if you have any limits on abortion, um, and if so, what are they? Do I personally? So I'll tell you what, where I am on this issue. I don't think the government belongs in anybody's doctor's office, man or woman. I, I, don't, want, I don't want the government telling me whether I can have my tubes tied, which I did after my second child was born. I don't want the government telling you know, you, whether you can get some sort of procedure. I just don't think that is an appropriate place for the government to be. If that doesn't mean I'm pro-abortion, what it means is I think that the government needs to stay the hell out of people's doctor's offices, period. Yes, sir. Uh, simple question. At the point of uh, pregnancy, when it's in the um, eighth month, uh, 29th day, 20, 23rd hour, would you allow the, uh, the abortion to take place at that exact second? Year? An actual abortion at that, that late stage of pregnancy? I do not think that should be allowed. I don't think, I mean, what is? I mean, you know, that that's my answer. I, I'm not going to get into whether I think that's happening or not, but no, I don't think that should happen. Well, I, that's, I was good. I don't, I didn't want to go there. I just wanted to answer the gentleman's question. I'm sorry. Anybody making the decision to have an abortion at a late stage is not doing it lightly. This is a medical issue that this person is having, and it's, like you said, it's no one else's business. What happens between that person and their physician? I, well, Pete Buttigieg did say that, but let me just say to the gentleman's point, because he was very specific about the timing, even in, in, if that's, in that situation, I suspect that any doctor is going to deliver that baby, whatever the outcome might be. Right, but that I, that should be the outcome. And then what happens to that baby is another matter and, you know, whether they can. Whether they intervene with extra, you know, extraordinary means. But see, this is where I get back to what I originally said. You know, I think you could ask any group, you know, a group of parents, if you had this situation in the third month of pregnancy and you found out your child was going, let's just say Down syndrome, um, different people, different sets of parents are gonna respond differently. And honestly, I believe that is their choice. Um, and that's, that's where I, that's as close as I can come to answering the question. Okay.
I don't see any other hands. Thank you for being a really, you know, maybe it was good to have a little interactive discussion at the beginning because we actually got more of a variety of questions and more uh, audience engagement, which I really like. I will tell you this, every single th thing I hear when I'm home in the district, which is about 50% of the time, by the way, when they tell you that Congress is in recess, what that means, I don't know why they have to use that term, it means we're back in our home districts working, but every single thing that I hear on the ground here goes back with me to Washington, whether it's talking to my team about what kind of legislation can we introduce that would help this, whether it's just informing how I vote on an issue, um, it, it's really important. And so what you're participating in is literally called the democratic process. I think it is vital that we uphold our democratic process. It's one of the beautiful things about this country is that we're allowed to speak out. And you can raise your hand and tell me you think I'm an idiot and nobody's gonna shoot you or you know, throw a shoe at you or whatever. Um, and, but that's, and that's the way our democracy was designed and I, I wanna see us continue it. And all I can, I don't have control over much, but I do have control over making sure that everybody's voices are heard here. And that's what I'm trying to do. So thank you so much. Thank you.